Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Matthew Klein. Matthew is an economics commentator at Barron's and the author of a new book with Michael Pettis titled Trade Wars Are Class Wars, How Rising Inequality Distorts the Global Economy and Threatens International Peace. Matthew is also a previous guest of Macro Musing, so I encourage the listeners to go back and check out the episode if they haven't already. Matthew, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much for having me. It's glad to have you on. Now, uh, you are a fellow veteran of the blogging years, of uh, lots of writing. I mean, you were at FT Alphaville. You've also written for Bloomberg, The Economist. So we've interacted a lot over the past decade. And like I've mentioned before, you you were on the show before. It's great to have you back on. But uh, you've taken all this knowledge and, and you've really applied it in a new direction. You've written a book, right? And it's 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 an interesting book. Um, I, I think it makes an original argument. And, and I'm excited to have you on to talk about it today. You wrote the book with Michael Pettis, who's in China. So you guys are in two different continents. And I'm just curious, how did this book project start? What what motivated you, catalyzed you to get it going? Sure. So at, you know, as we joke, actually, in the acknowledgement, this was a, a trans-Pacific partnership because uh, I'm in San Francisco and he's in Beijing. I mean, essentially, we had known each other or known of each other's work for quite a while. I, I had actually been introduced to Michael's writings my first job when I was when I was in finance and, you know, been trying to follow him for a while. And then when I was an intern at The Economist, you know, he happened to read the free exchange blog, which I contributed to. And so sometimes he'd seen things and, you know, saw when I wrote about things that he'd been writing about, particularly in the context of Europe and China. And we sort of got in touch a little bit, you know, occasionally sending each other emails that way. And then Alphaville, when I was there at uh, the Financial Times, again, he, you know, he regularly read that. And so he saw when I did things and, you know, he actually visited New York uh, a couple times and when I was there and we, we met that way. So we kind of knew each other from that perspective. And I've, I've in fact learned a lot from him over the years, including a lot of the big ideas, quite frankly, in this book came from my reading and trying to, you know, think through uh, a lot of his big ideas that he's expressed over the years. And essentially the, this book came about because at the end of 2017, um, he was thinking of doing a book about trade because obviously that was a really big issue then and uh, still is a big issue. And thinking about, you know, what what has changed since his previous book, which was The Great Rebalancing, which was also a really interesting book and has some of the, you know, on similar themes of analytical style, but, you know, trying to put it in sort of a more comprehensive context, and, you know, not just updating it, but also kind of really making it something that, you know, can set, you know, reach the broadest possible audience. And, uh, much to my pleasant surprise, he, he reached out to me and said, you know, I had this idea for the book. Here's the basic argument we would do. Here's sort of the general outline of stuff. You want to work together and to make this happen. And I said, yeah, that sounds fantastic. And then I thought, well, actually, wait a minute. I, was, I had done research. One of my earlier jobs was a research assistant for another book, um, The Man Who Knew. It's the biography of Don Greenspan with Sebastian Allen wrote, which is a great book. I strongly recommend it. But that took him six years plus uh, having multiple research assistants continuously throughout that entire period. And I thought, man, writing a book sounds pretty hard. And that was his full-time job, not, you know. Right. So I, I kind of waffled a bit. It turns out, fortunately, that writing this book was relatively less challenging than writing in-depth biography of uh, someone. So that was helpful. I mean, there's still a lot of work, but, you know, comparatively speaking, obviously, you can just look at the chronology and, and this was a relatively easier task. So once I kind of wrapped my head around that, I thought, you know, we should definitely do this. And uh, we did. I actually spent in the fall, in October 2018, I spent about a week and a half actually at Michael's place in, in Beijing, and did some like intense, you know, work there basically all day. Um, but yeah, that's basically, you know, I write stuff, he write stuff, and send it back and forth, and that's that's how it works. From start to finish, how long did it take you? I'm curious myself. So one thing that's interesting about uh, the book publishing industry is that there are a lot of lags, at least at least in like the academic press, there are a lot of lags between, um, you know, when you say you're going to start the book and when the book actually is done and then when the book comes out. And that's partly based on their certain release dates that they want to target. So, for example, if you finish a book in January, but they say they want, you know, they, their researchers, you know, we basically have books come out in sort of late spring, early fall, and those are two windows, then you're going to have a gap, obviously. And then there's, you know, time to edit and, and things like that. So a lot of the work was done basically between sort of April 
So basically from like April 2018 to the end of 2018 was when we wrote the first draft and that was the bulk of it. And then uh, we did sort of various edits and stuff throughout 2019, which were somewhere substantial, but you know, obviously the bulk of it was just writing the first part. And then it was basically done by January of, of this year or so. And then, you know, sort of, because there's also, you know, getting the printers and, and getting that stuff all done. So that that's another reason, that's part of the reason why they lags. And so, yeah, that's, you know, how, how you want to count that. I mean, as I said, the, the really intense period of work was basically from April through the end of 2020. Okay. Well, it was a great journey, a great amount of work for you to do, but you've turned out an interesting product. Again, the title of the book is Trade Wars or Class Wars, How Rising Inequality Distorts the Global Economy and Threatens International Peace. So why don't you tell us the central claim of your book? It's in the title, but work us through the, the, the key idea you're trying to get across in this book. So yes, it is the title we tried, you know, that was, you know, had to noodle that around. We thought that was, you know, put the piece in the title. <laughs> right. <laughs> You know, the application of that is that, you know, a lot of people think about trade conflicts as being about countries versus countries, that there's some kind of either geopolitical angle or there's some sort of incompatible national interests or even sort of cultural things going on. And the sort of underlying premise is that global prosperity is this scarce resource and you have to fight over it. And we're saying that's completely the wrong way of thinking about it. And that if you really want to understand why there are things that look like trade conflicts coming about, why you know, governments might even engage in the kinds of activities that we've seen, particularly the U.S. and China, but not exclusively that, then you really have to understand what's going on within countries. And that what actually is occurring in a lot of situations is that there are these dynamics within countries, you can call them class conflicts, you can call them, you know, rich versus poor, you can call them transfers of wealth and income. But regardless, the net effect is that these domestic issues that are generally being done by people within a country for their own reasons, they're not really actually thinking about the impact of the rest of the world. But because the economy is, the global economy is a sort of unified system, more or less, that those choices and the, those events in those countries will have profound consequences for people in other places. And that will show up, among other things, in the trade data. It will show up in financial flows. It will show up in, in terms of debt and unemployment and all these other things that we describe in the book. And that's what we want people to understand. And so, you know, putting it more concretely, you know, the U.S. and China, if you're an American worker and you feel as if the Chinese government has done things that are bad to you, you're probably right. But to be clear, the reason that you're right is because the Chinese government did things that were bad for the vast majority of people who live in China. And it's a, a side effect of those choices that American workers have been harmed. So it's not as if there's, you know, um, Chinese workers are prospering at the expense of American workers. That's actually completely wrong. They would have done much better. You know, rather, if they had done much better, American workers would have been better off than they were. And that's really, you know, essentially what we're, what we're trying to convey here. And that has applications for a lot of other places. Most obvious, you know, Europe is another area where we really try to hammer this one because it doesn't seem like it's connected, but it's the same dynamic that apply. Yeah. And so when you say trade wars in your title, you're really talking about trade wars that have occurred like over the past decade or so, right? Your, your, your context is the struggles we've seen between the U.S. and China. I mean, most recently, President Trump and his his, his uh, battles is maybe the most recent manifestation of that. But but over the past decade, right, we had huge current account surpluses in China, created tensions back then even. Trump isn't the first one to this party. He's the most intense player at the party. But this has been going on. But I, I think the story you're painting is, is one to help us understand what's happened over this period. Is that fair? Yeah, I would just say it's probably, it's longer than 10 years. I mean, so the bulk of, I'm going to do sort of the detailed historical narrative is really actually the past sort of 30 years and some of the events that occurred in, in the 90s it took a little while for them to bear fruit but was, you can sort of go back to that period and really by the time you get to, by the time you get to the 2000s that's where you're already seeing these trade dynamics these, you know trade wars trade you know the harmful impact of trade essentially that's when it starts to show up whether it's china or whether it's in europe okay yeah, so it's been brewing for a longer time than the past decade, but maybe, you know, for most people, they're seeing it during this, this time. And of course, we've had two sharp recessions, which have exacerbated the, the pain um, from, from this, this tension. So, okay, so that, that's, that's the central claim of the view that, that developments within countries, particularly China and also in Germany, have led to the, the trade tensions, trade wars that we've seen. And you have a, a framework that you appeal to, the, the Hobson view or Hobsonian view of, of trade wars, if I'm saying that properly. 
So why don't you explain that to our listeners and how does it help you and Michael make sense of what's going on? Sure. So the funny thing about this, this thesis is that it's actually quite old. That, now, John Hobson was writing in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and he wrote a book called Imperialism that came out in 1902. And he basically makes a lot of the points that we make, but in a different context. So essentially what his point was that you want to understand European imperialism. You have to understand the internal dynamics of the distribution of income within the major European powers. And his argument essentially is that because Britain and Germany and France and so forth were such unequal societies, the consequences of that meant that they necessarily had to go abroad to find markets to sell for their goods and to find uh, attractive investment opportunities. And that was a driving force of imperialism. Not necessarily the only driving force of imperialism, obviously there's complex social forces, but it was an important point, uh, an important factor. And that's the point he made. And it's really, as I said, fascinating to go through the you know, step-by-step the argument and how it, 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 it applies just as well. I mean, the principles he's talking about, the dynamics of the economy are not, you know, even though the world's a lot different now than it was then, they're just as applicable. And there was uh, an economist of the United States Treasury Department and Kenneth Austin, who actually wrote a paper, I believe in 2011, and basically explicitly making this link that Hobson's view uh, can be, you know, is legitimate, is, is just as valid, and you just need to update it. So instead of that, you know, it's England and France and Germany as the imperialists, you have, you know, China and Japan, Germany again, and then the colonies, instead of being, you know, India or Latin America or Africa, it's the U.S. and the U.K. And, and so, you know, obviously, again, you know, is the U.S. literally a, a colonial subject of, of China? No, obviously not. There's a, a lot of important differences. But from an economic perspective, there are a lot of very interesting similarities. And so he made that point. It was published, I believe, in the Journal of post keynesian Economics. So I'm not sure how much of a, um, how widely read it was at the time. But, you know, it's absolutely right. And essentially what we are trying to do is say, like, you can take this framework and apply it really broadly and, and you know, explain it to people. It's very helpful to provide a lot of historical context, which is what we try to do in the book. Interestingly enough, I used to work with Kenneth Austin at Treasury, <laughs> and uh, he actually sent me that paper, so I've seen it. So it was uh, fun to read your book and see you you quote him on that. So, uh, yeah, he's an old friend that we go way back as, as well, back to my Treasury days. Okay, so again, the, the central thesis of your book, or claim of your book, is this growing inequality within countries is creating tension between countries. And we're going to go into more detail, look country by country, look at Germany, what happened in Germany, what happened in, in the China, and see the details of these developments. But just for a quick kind of overview before we get into all that, are these developments like people intentionally trying to screw things up, or is it just kind of how, how things unfolded? I mean, if you just step back, 30,000-foot view, I mean, is, is, do you see the growing inequality kind of maybe inevitable, or could things have been done differently, I guess, is my question. Um, were we destined to experience some of this pain before this all gets sorted out? That's an interesting question, and I'm not sure you know, what the answer is. I, I think that there definitely were deliberate choices that were made, and that's part of what we, ch- we try to trace yep. out. Was it something where someone had a grand plan at the beginning of this is what the consequence would be? I don't, I don't think so. But uh, you can look at the individual countries. Every, every country is a very different story. The reason we focus so much on China and Germany, by the way, is not just because those are two of the most important economies, but also because between the two of them, you can kind of cover a lot of the bases for the other major surplus economies we don't discuss. So, okay. North Korea, Switzerland, Sweden, you know, things, places like that. You know, they're all every the Netherlands. They all have different stories. Or you know, you could one could imagine writing about all of them. But you know, China and Germany are are the biggest, and you know, you can sort of between them kind of get a mix. And essentially, there's sort of a couple different factors. And again, depends on the place. But in China, what happened was you had. I mean, they're very much tied into politics, essentially. So it really began in the early 1990s. And what happened? You know, before the early 1990s is, is, I think, relevant here to understanding this, which is that China had, you know, been for a very, very long time, we're talking well over 100 years, basically increasingly impoverished, both in absolute terms and relative to the rest of the world, basically since the early 1800s. And it got tremendously worse in the 20th century with civil wars and foreign invasions and then Maoism and all of the consequences of that. 
And by the time you get to the 1970s, it was a extremely poor country. And in fact, extremely poor relative to where you think China would have been given its history. And that created a lot of opportunities for some quick and easy gains. And what happened by the time you get to the late 1970s is uh, Deng Xiaoping and his colleagues come into power after Mao has died, after the Gang of Four has been removed. And they try to liberalize various aspects of the economy. And they focus first on the agricultural sector because A, that's where most Chinese people live, and B, because it was considered less strategic. So there was less fear of losing control, whereas the industrial sector, you know, heavy industries, military connections, like that was something you want to have more of a tight control on. And so that actually worked quite well initially. And when you look at the 1980s, growth is quite rapid because essentially there's a lot of you know, you remove all these imposed restrictions and people can kind of get back to where they should have been relatively quickly. And productivity in agriculture increases quite rapidly. People in the countryside start doing sort of light industry things. There's surpluses they can invest in. And that's great. But, you know, the downside is because they didn't have the similar changes in the cities and the industrial sector of the economy, you end up having some weird price distortions where some prices are still capped and other prices are set freely. And the net effect is by the time you get to the late 1980s, you have pretty rapid food price inflation. And so if you live in the city, then suddenly your standard of living might not be going up as much as you thought it would have been or probably even going down. And that obviously leads to instability. There's obviously also at the same time the cause of the economic liberalization that had been occurring. And to an extent also political liberalization that was occurring. There was an expert, you know, it was not clear what the limits of that was going to be. And so you get all these factors um, interacting with each other and you know, one of the consequences of this is sort of mass protests by the late 1980s. So actually, there was a first wave of this in 87 that did not end the way we're familiar with. But then there was another one in 89, the pro-democracy movement, which was not just in Beijing. It was really all across China. And it wasn't just students. It was also, you know, workers and so forth, because essentially they had there were a whole range of grievances. I don't want to say it was just about food prices or anything like that. But they were, you know, essentially expecting change. And, and quite frankly, you know, I think initially many of those people, this is somewhat speculative, but based on, you know, reading secondary accounts and stuff, I don't think most of the people actually did want to completely overthrow the system, but there was a, in fact, like the reason that you have the mass gathering in, in Tiananmen Square in Beijing was to um, sort of celebrate the, the, not celebrate the death, but really to sort of honor Hu Yaobang and his death. He was a member of the Central Committee who was considered sort of a champion of, of the liberals. And, you know, so there wasn't, you know, but anyhow, it was interpreted as being a fundamental threat to the regime by, by Deng and others. And so then they come in and violently crush it. And then what's interesting as a consequence is that this essentially discredits within uh, the Chinese leadership the sort of liberalizing tendencies. And so even Deng himself he doesn't you know, lose power completely, but he loses influence. And you have a period in 89, 90, um, 91, really, where the Orthodox communists come into power and they want to essentially roll back a lot of the changes that had occurred in the 80s. But that doesn't work very well. And so it doesn't look like a recession, strictly speaking, in the data, but it's a significant, significant slowdown in GDP growth in that period relative to what it was either before or after. And that discredits them. And so then by the time you get to 92, Deng comes back with his southern tour, and essentially you start seeing a real shift in China's economic policymaking. And so then what happens is essentially you want to have a situation, or they want to have a situation where they could have really rapid growth, to sort of bolster their legitimacy. I mean, who doesn't? But at the same time, they also wanted to generate that growth without simply doing sort of the liberalizing stuff they did in the 80s. They wanted to have a degree of control. Because, it, you know, and, and again, this, you could argue this goes back to sort of, you know, Leninist ideology, but essentially, if, if you think, if you have alternative centers of power in society, which can include just people who are economically prosperous who aren't directly affiliated with the regime, then that's a problem. And so one of the things that you can do to achieve that outcome is essentially an off-the-shelf model, more or less, that they used, um, which goes back to uh, you know, Alexander Gershenkron described it in, in the 50s, the Ukrainian economist, and essentially it's you know, state-led, investment-led growth. And what that means in practice is you squeeze workers and household consumers as much as you feasibly can to generate uh, income and, and provide cheap resources for government and government affiliated businesses to invest. And if you do it correctly, that will lead to quite rapid growth without having to worry about destabilizing inflation and contracts. And that's what they did. And at first that worked out really well because the conditions for where that works is that 
you know, some combination of the following, either a lot of good investment opportunities are available. And so you're easily going to find them, even if you don't have a good screening mechanism for what's a good investment, or you do have a good screening mechanism for investment, which is much harder because, you know, historical track is bad. It's poor. And in the nineties, it worked out very well for China because, you know, the country had been so deprived of investment for so long. And as I said, basically you go back to the 1830s, at least was, you know, everything's been down, was downhill from then until the 1970s. There was a lot of, a lot of opportunities to make good investments. That starts to become problematic by the time you get to these thousands. And this is where Michael really kind of brings in his level of expertise. You know, he's been living in, in China for almost 20 years. And, and his theory on this, what I think is really interesting, is that the amount of investment and the, the total amount of capital stock in a society that's optimal really depends on these intangible, soft cultural capital, essentially social capital features. And in his view, I think, you know, you can also see it kind of borne out in the data that China had sort of hit its limit by the time you get to the early 2000s. And so that meant that, you know, there were still good investments to be made and some of those investments were being made, but the amount of investment that's actually occurring was in excess of that. And what you should have had happen in China was a redistribution from the elites that were benefiting, because in practice that is what was happening, right? Whether it's whether it's local government, provincial officials, or the heads of state or enterprises, or, or what have you, they were the ones who were getting the the spending power on their behalf, and also showing up in various benefits, personal direct benefits, and giving it to workers and and, and consumers in China. That didn't happen, and the initial impact was to create a massive glut of goods that was exported. And that was the story really of the 2000s up until about 2008. But then when 2008 happens and suddenly China's main export markets are relatively less receptive, uh, not certainly able to grow as quickly and capture and, and absorb China's excess production. And so then essentially the government decides to go sort of an overdrive and boosting domestic investment even further. And that's when you start to see, again, this is sort of a, a, a sort of a clear uh, financial market signal that the investment was excessive is that before that point, China's overall you know, total debt to GDP ratio was pretty flat in the 2000s. Debt to GDP was rising outside of China as sort of a consequence. So they were, they, that was sort of how it spread abroad. But once you get past 2008, suddenly all of that, you know, wasteful debt accumulation to fund unnecessary purchases was directed inward in China. And the debt ratio, total debt in China goes from roughly you know, 100-ish percent of GDP to almost 300 percent of GDP in a span of, you know, less than 10 years, which is essentially unprecedented, especially in a period when, when growth is actually quite rapid. And that suggests, obviously, that the value of those investments, the incremental value was quite low, which is consistent with Michael's interpretation that uh, the despite being relatively poor in one perspective with a sort of capital stock per person compared to other, you know, compared to advanced economy, that Maybe the capital stock of person is, is actually excessive in China relative to their ability to, you know, maximize them. And that's probably a function of some of those things, sort of the political and social system. So just to summarize, in the case of China, the communist leadership led the country down this path. Intentional choices were made, and it led to this outcome, which is now being borne by the rest of the world and has been borne by the West, rest of the world over the, the past decades. So I, I guess my question, going back to the original question, is – was there an easier path or a better path the communist leadership could have taken? I mean, would it have been just more liberalization, more privatization, less control? I mean, was there a feasible, actual different path that they could have taken, maintained their power? I don't know. You know, I, I guess that's my inevitable question, you know. And I know that's a hard question to answer. You're not God. You don't know what, what else could have happened. But is, is there something like Michael could have, Michael Pettis would have called for for them to do that would have maybe eased some of this so one thing is interesting and this is a point that, that michael has made is that you know initially it works really well and initially it's probably the best thing you could do in the short term the problem is that once you adopt this model it becomes increasingly difficult to change it and it will almost always go oh, past. and and the the reason for that is that sort of by definition you're empowering a sort of a select elite group of people and enriching them. And that makes them obviously very vested in the perpetuation of this model. And a lot of times, especially in a, in a situation like this, they have direct political power. Even if they didn't, you know, they'd probably be able to exert a lot of influence. And so that means that you're sort of inevitably 
going to run, it's going to be challenging to change those things. You need a really decisive break. And it's quite rare um, for that to happen. Usually, as I said, these things will go past their cell by day. There are other countries that have had experiences like this to varying degrees. So Brazil, for example, the military dictatorship there in the 50s and 60s, in many ways, that was kind of like what happened in China. That, that was the miracle economy at the time, but, you know, sort of went well past its sell by date and then it ended quite, quite poorly for them. And, you know, you could also arguably talk about the Soviet Union, actually. They had a situation as well in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And then again, it, you know, it, it sort of hit its limit. And then, and so that's a, that's a challenge, it's sort of an inherent danger of adopting this model. And arguably the countries that have done the best with it were Korea and Japan. And even then, though, you know, Japan, people talk about stagnation. I think that story is somewhat overstated because, you know, you have to look at yeah. the demography. But, you know, regardless, they were able to at least get to a very high standard of living before that happened. And that was helpful. And Korea is interesting because, you know, they as well managed to get to a high standard of living. And their economy is still, you know, converging to a degree. But, you know, in, in both Japan and Korea, well, Japan is basically always to varying degrees during, you know, its development story. A, somewhat you know liberal democracy you, know, you, can, you can argue about how yeah. much of it but it basically it was korea was not but when it ran into trouble with its development model in the 80s it became a democracy so it was an authoritarian regime military dictatorship in the 60s and 70s and 80s but then it transitioned and it actually transitioned relatively well and then that helped i mean so there, there are issues still in the korean economy that you know we don't talk about in the book but it's sort of related to this but you know they were able i think and so I think that there is a connection between the political system and the economic system. So if you're asking what China could have done differently, I don't know, to be honest, how the Communist Party would have done things differently in a way that they would have felt comfortable with in terms of maintaining their political dominance. And so, I mean, I think that's why they ended up going down the road they did. I mean, yeah. That's sort of me speculating, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, there are other things that could have been done in theory in China, but you might have had a very different sort of political system as an outcome. But your, the point you and, and Michael make in the book, though, is that this can't go on forever, and there's going to be our day of reckoning sooner, sooner rather than later, right? That's right, although there's interesting what that means can be a lot of different things. So, you know, the idea that China's going to have some imminent financial crisis or collapse, I personally don't think it's particularly likely. I know Michael does not think that's likely. The likeliest outcome from that perspective is you're just going to have a long period of stagnation and slow growth, which would be quite traumatic for a society that's used to having extremely rapid growth for the past yeah. you know, years. But it wouldn't be, you know, sort of a, you know, Latin America style collapse in the early 80s. It's a sort yep. of alternative to what I think of. It wouldn't be that, probably. But yeah, it's not sustainable. I mean, obviously, the other way of around it is, you know, as we say in the book, you can, there are plenty of changes that can be made. And in theory, those changes have all been endorsed by the Communist Party leadership that would redistribute income towards Chinese workers and, and households and consumer savers and consumers, all the people. And would allow for the kinds of changes that would be sustainable and, and lead the higher living standards in China and also help rebalance the global economy. The problem is, even though the Chinese leadership has repeatedly endorsed this, it hasn't happened. And so that sort of speaks to the power of these, you know, um, I believe it was uh, Premier Li Keqiang called them the vested interest uh, in a speech in I think it was 2013 and talking about the that that's the reason why it's hard to make these changes. And that's sort of the consequence of the development model, that despite the commitment of people at the top, unless you make that your overwhelming priority in the sense of everything else, you know, it's still, you know, it's still, there's still politics in an authoritarian system and you still have to negotiate with different constituents to get what you want. And, and it's apparently been hard for them to do that or it hasn't been enough of a priority, but either way, and that that's sort of the, uh, the troubling situation there is that they haven't been making, able to make those changes. Yeah, and it's interesting to think about this day of reckoning. Again, you, you say it may be a more of a gradual stagnation day of reckoning, um, but they also have demographics going against them too, right? So they're, they build up a lot of debt, there's, there's cronyism, there's like a dynamism, and you throw in a lack of you know new young workers, you're really asking for trouble. That's absolutely right. I mean, something we don't really talk about in the book per se, but the fact that the Chinese working age population is already falling and is set to fall quite dramatically over the next few decades is something that's definitely going to be challenging for them to deal with. And also the productivity. It depends how you measure productivity. It's always a tricky thing to define in any society. It's certainly hard in, in you know, an economy like China, but there are estimates that are reasonable that suggest that productivity growth in China has essentially been zero for the past while. In other words, you know, after subtracting 
the gains that we would have expected from the immense amount of capital investment, the sort of underlying or total factor productivity or whatever, has been essentially zero for decades. And if that's the case, then that's obviously going to be a real challenge as well, especially as fixed investment has. Yeah, I mean, that's something we should all be watching and mindful of. Now, let's circle back and talk about the, again, the economic implications of all of this. So, real easy to make the case that China, for example, was manipulating its currency in the mid 2000s. It ran huge current account surpluses, 10% of GDP, which is huge. I mean, kind of a rule of thumb I've heard is if you're running over 3% of GDP current account surpluses, then you're probably intervening in an artificial way. And, and so many of those those indicators are now gone, right? So China's running a small current account surplus. Um, it, it isn't manipulating its currency despite President Trump's <laughs> claims um, by most measures. Are they still doing things, though, that are, are creating problems for the world? And I think you alluded to this in your book. Are, are, are they still running surpluses in, in certain areas that cause distortions elsewhere in the world? Yeah, so I, I think there are a couple of ways of looking at this. One is that I'm not convinced that the rebalancing of the Chinese economy that we've seen relative to the rest of the world, as you've mentioned, is something that's sustainable. And the reason is because what we were just talking about, that if, if domestic investment is going to stagnate, or I mean, it's already slowed down tremendously, right? The rate of fixed asset investment growth in China had been sort of 20 to 30% for a long time. Now it's, you know, before the coronavirus, it was like 5 to 6%. So already you've had that. And that's shown up in the slowdown of the growth rate. So if that happens, and if that accelerates, then at some point you're going to have a situation where Chinese you know, total domestic demand, in other words, is going to be falling back. And then that's going to lead to a situation where if there's, unless they cut their production as well and have higher unemployment, which doesn't seem to be something that you know, they would choose to do, I mean, don't blame them for that, that's going to lead to re-emergence of the imbalances. And so the challenge, there's essentially a trade-off between uh, their external position, their domestic indebtedness position, and this question of you know the distribution of income they can you know as we saw sort of before 2008 they were able to keep their domestic indebtedness quite under control because their external position and essentially their trade partners bore the brunt of that with higher debt and then after 2008 china bore the brunt of higher debt and their trade partners relatively speaking did not although china did still have surpluses during this period but they were much smaller you know at this point if they conclude or are forced to be in a situation where they can no longer increase their indebtedness rapidly in order to support domestic demand, then you have to think that you're going to have some kind of reversion to the sort of pre-2008 scenario, and that would be quite quite troubling. And you're already seeing hints of where that could be an issue. So you mentioned you know, different sectors of, of, of their, their trade balance. So if you look at their current account balance as a whole, uh, it, it's come down tremendously, and that's obviously great progress. Some of that, however, is probably a little bit misleading. So, for example, if you look at the tourism trade account, there are a lot of issues with the numbers, and they've been revised repeatedly in different ways. And but basically, no matter how you count it, there's the tourism trade or the travel trade deficit in China is extremely overstated. What that really means is that actually the, the trade, their overall trade balance is, is higher than it was. And there's obviously people trying to move their money out of the country, and such that's probably what is being counted instead. The other thing is that if you focus just on manufactured goods, which is arguably the main source of what you know, the displacement that China caused in this world anyway. That trade surplus is actually as big as it's ever been. And the reason it's as big as it's ever been is because China's, uh, the Chinese government has been very successful at curtailing imports. So the idea of China as being a major export-led growth story is not really true anymore. Um, exports and share of GDP in China have come down pretty steadily over time. But imports have come down more. And that's partly because, you know, they don't need to import as many foreign components in their exports. And part of it is also just their own uses of, of imports have, have gone down. And so they become much more self-sufficient. This is in fact the state goal of government policy made in China 2025. They don't you know, highlight that much anymore because it obviously attracts a lot of attention from the U.S. and Europe. But it's still basically part of, of the strategy. And so, again, you can sort of see them laying the groundwork for a world where if domestic demand in China falls, that is going to, you know, they're going to essentially try to, shift that so the burden is going to be borne by people in the rest of the world rather than produced in China, which, again, from sort of a narrow perspective, that makes sense. But um, it, it would have significant impact on, on foreigners. And just one, one more point on this is that I, if you want to understand China's Belt and Road Initiative, I think it helps to put it in, the, in this sort of context that 
again, like people talk about it in terms of geopolitics and there might be something to it. It probably helps them, you know, people sell that internally in China. But, you know, the economic perspective I think is more useful, which is that if your main export markets, traditional export markets are not growing very much, not able to absorb, and you're worried about a situation where your external position is going to be needed to help you deal with it internally balancing, then it helps to find new markets. And so instead of you taking out a lot of debt internally to make wasteful investments, you essentially find people outside of your country to take out a lot of debt to make wasteful investments that are built by you. Um, and that is, I think, one way of interpreting how, you know, the Belt and Road and that sort of fitting. But, you know, to your original question, I think that despite the progress we've seen, they're not manipulating their currencies as well. Um, the way they used to, the current account debt sort of smaller, that there are a lot of fundamental problems there that pose a, a danger to the rest of the world. Okay, let me ask this question. Again, we're, we're looking at the problems within China and, and how it's given rise to the, the challenges outside China. And you mentioned this in your book, that even though consumption is um, suppressed, it still has risen in an absolute sense, right? So so people, I mean, you hear this claim, and I, I believe it, I think you do too, that, that China has been the, the greatest cure for poverty around the world, right? There's been a billion people lifted out of poverty. So Chinese are better off than they would have, than they were. But your contention and Michael's contention is that they could have been even better off than they were. I mean, not only lifted out of poverty, but everyone having a middle class lifestyle. Is, is that the argument? I don't know about everyone having a, a middle class, you know, U.S. lifestyle, but I do think it's it's definitely fair to say that living standards should have been higher than they were. Okay. I mean, I mean just the way to the simplest way to look at it is that as a share of total national production, that consumption household consumption went from being in sort of 50, 55 percent in the 80s to below 40 percent, which is a dramatic decline. And so presumably, now unless you think that that was absolutely necessary for raising absolute living standards, and that there was no other way to raise absolute living standards. And that means that households lost out tremendously. And there are a lot of specific things we can point to that suggest that that, that living standards could have been improved. And one thing, obviously, is just if you're making a lot of wasteful investments, if you have a choice of making a wasteful investment or actually just giving someone a consumption good and service that they like, clearly they're worse off if you, if you do the wasteful investment instead. And so that, I think, is probably the simplest way of looking at it. I think also the question of you know China reducing poverty, it's definitely true that Chinese growth since the 1970s has reduced global poverty tremendously. But I also think it's true, and this sort of gets back to what we were saying before, the extent that you're essentially having, you know, mean version, that it was artificially depressed in terms of productivity and output and living standards for a very long time before the, you know, up through the 1970s. You know, how much credit does the particular development model have or the government policies have versus essentially not doing the things, you know, it's amazing what you can accomplish when you're not constantly being invaded or having a civil war or a cultural revolution or anything like that. Um, so I think that that is a large element of it. And I think that, you know, you know, people should recognize that as being a major driver, I think, of the progress that we've seen. Okay. Yeah, so it's interesting to think of China as, as a true case of what Austrian economists would say, malinvestment. <laughs> you didn't use that term in your book, but I couldn't help but think of it when you talked about the the different you know, poor uses of funds and stuff. But... uh yeah, definitely clear. Well, let's let's switch gears. We'll come back to Germany in a bit because China is, I think, a big part of the story here. And let's talk about the transmission of, of China's, you know, suppressed consumption. Therefore, it's it's enlarged savings. How that gets channeled into places like the U.S. Um, walk us through that. And then, but along the way, I want you to answer this question for me. Sometimes you hear this story, and and I I believe you know what you're about to tell because I've pers- I've said it myself. But but one of the, the questions you get is, in what sense was China's savings forced into the U.S.? I mean, could the U.S. have said, no, we don't want your savings? I mean, from an accounting perspective, it has to balance somewhere, as you know, in the book. But was the U.S. like a force? Were they a slave to the savings coming in? Could they have said no? Could they have done policy differently to offset it? So maybe walk us through how it works, and then what could the U.S. have done differently, if possible? Sure. So I think the easiest way to explain this is to just zoom out for a bit and like, what is the global problem here? And the global problem is that, you know, there's a certain amount of productive capacity and there's a certain amount of global demand for what that capacity is able to produce. And there's been essentially a mismatch for quite a while. I don't know exactly, you know, I don't know when you put a date on exactly, probably, you know, on the order of 40 years or so. And that has shown up in the form of a, you know, sort of 
falling cost of capital and to essentially deflation, disinflation, whatever you want to call it, very not really as meaningful price pressures on, on consumer goods had in the past. And in the form of rising indebtedness by people who don't have the income growth they had before in order to consume enough to you know, prevent the complete essentially collapse of the global economy given the sort of mismatch between production and global demand. That's the basic picture. And so then the question is, okay, how do these different forces get distributed across countries? And our point is that we can point to sort of specific places where policies have directly contributed to the underconsumption relative to production, including China and Germany. And then you say, okay, well, given that that's happened, but we haven't been in global depression for the entire past you know, 40 years, the corollary must be there must, that there are other places elsewhere that are consuming relatively more in terms of what they produce, and that they are financing that consumption through increasing indebtedness. And so that happens to be, among other places, the United States. It's really the entire English-speaking world. Uh, you know, the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand have very similar you know, patterns of behavior here. But you know, the US is a much bigger economy, so the US is sort of the dominant story. And that's sort of the big picture, which is also Hobbes' sort of view of imperialism to bring it back to that. That you know, if you have a situation where in England, France, and Germany, and so forth, you have this excess of stuff. It has to go somewhere. And because that excess is a function of the fact there isn't enough domestic demand in those countries because of the distribution of income. But, you know, most people consume everything they earn, but if they don't earn that much, they can't consume it. There wasn't consumer credit. There were not consumer credit markets back then that could have sort of offset that. So they meant sending it to the colonies. And the U.S. is a little different. But the modern world is, is in many ways kind of similar in how this, how this works. So that means that you're going to have both an excess of stuff and an excess of financial, you know, demand for financial assets, those things necessarily are going to go together. And, you know, where they end up is going to have, you know, affect the people in those societies. The U.S. is a major recipient, has been and continues to be a major recipient of, of excess production and excess savings, you know, essentially the same, you know, two sides of the same, same phenomenon. And the reason for that is because the U.S. maintains a relative, I mean, there are several reasons, but the biggest reason is the U.S. maintains a relatively open financial system and has a legal system that is very accommodating to foreign investors, including the fact that it's in English, which is obviously something you can't change. But uh, what that means is that if you are an entity or a rich person or what have you in the rest of the world that has excess savings and you're looking to put it somewhere that you think is reasonably safe, the U.S. is a very attractive place. It's not the only place, but it's a very attractive place to do it because you know that you'll be protected in a certain way. You know that you don't, you know, you might lose out in terms of dollar depreciation or something, but you're not going to, the risk of catastrophic loss is actually zero and you can access it when you want and that's useful. And then on top of the fact is the U.S. is a very large diversified economy. It produces a lot of things. So, you know, if you have dollars, it's a pretty good place. You know, it's a good currency to hold for saving things. People in the rest of the world, for that reason, they will often price their stuff in dollars. So the value of holding a dollar is much larger than simply you can buy U.S. made stuff. You can buy stuff in Thailand or wherever. And so that creates a lot of incentives for people to put, put their money in, in U.S. assets. So could the U.S. have done something differently to prevent that? I mean, we'd have, essentially, if we change our legal system and we have to introduce capital controls or something, would be the way to do it. And that's, you know, maybe that's an approach. I mean, it's something you know, we talk about as a, a, a potential response to the problems that we highlighted as, as coming up. And you've already seen in some places, not in the U.S. so much, but in you know, sort of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, putting in restrictions on foreign uh, home purchases. So there's a little bit of that, but not really the same extent. If you do that, though, you simply redirect these flows somewhere else. So it's not really the, a permanent solution. I mean, I guess on the margin, it's better for the U.S., but it, wouldn't, but it just means that some other country, other society would have to deal with this excess of stuff. The other thing that people say you could do is, well, you could have a countervailing flow, right? So maybe, you know, the People's Bank of China is buying trillions of dollars of treasury and agency debt. So the U.S. could go out and, well, you can't buy Chinese assets and, and that kind of size because their market, capital markets were closed. So, I don't know, you buy, like, every single French government bond or something? I mean, that doesn't seem like a very... <laughs> that's what you would have had to have done, essentially. It's not even clear how well that would have worked. So, um, and, of course, again, that creates the problem of, at best, you're redirecting the excess elsewhere. And at worst, you simply just depressed your own domestic demand without increasing anyone else's. So the whole world is just you know, in a much worse situation. So I think part of what we, we talked about in the book is that you know, if you're the, the recipient country, the choices are limited and they're not particularly attractive in any, in any case. I mean, there are certain things you can do differently that might help 
but ultimately the problems are stemming from the places that are under consuming and so if you really want to have a sustainable solution you have to fix the policies there so i'm thinking about this matt from maybe a cyclical versus structural perspective so you could still run the economy at full employment and have an issue here right um so like the late 90s in the u.s we're running the economy, you know, full capacity, unemployment was relatively low. But the argument is that China is still affecting the structure of employment, right? What type of jobs are available? And so you could have, I guess, so my question is, if we tried to offset this with monetary policy, with fiscal policy, so people are still employed, even though they may lose their job in a factory, they get a job somewhere else. At the end of the day, I think your argument and Michael's argument is that it's a different job, and maybe it's not the same job, maybe it's not as good of a job. Um, is that the point you're making? Kind of the point. I mean, it's certainly, I mean, I'm not saying we want to preserve the structure of the economy completely and, you know, ignore. I mean, there are evolutions you'd expect in terms of productivity and so forth. And, uh, yeah. Like people. But, I mean, I think that in certain cases, you yeah do want to preserve certain industries from what seems to be clear distortion coming from abroad. So one of the things we said might have been an improvement, you know, in retrospect, uh, in the 2000s, really, would have been, okay, if there's going to be a lot of debt generated one way or another in the U.S., it should be government debt, first of all, not private debt. So in other words, you're thinking about the difference between fiscal and monetary policy, that's essentially the choice you're making, is it government debt or private debt? Uh, and then if it is going to be government debt, you should be spending it on things that are going to as much as possible to either offset offset the impact and, and help their economy so one thing that could have obviously been done differently is you know for, if there's perpetual need for better infrastructure in the united states that would be helpful the other thing too which is uh kind of an, another idea which you know i'm not going to say that we flesh out in detail what it would have meant but if you can preserve demand for u.s made manufacturers to the point that you wouldn't have had the obliteration of a sector for was essentially a sort of one-off shock with what happened. I mean, that would have been very helpful um, if you can't go back and undo that completely, but that's the kind of thing that might have been, been helpful. But you know, your point about fiscal market policy, I mean, in many ways, the trade-off, one of the implicit trade-offs you have is that you're assuming that the economy is going at full employment. But if the economy is going at full employment, then the choice is, um, you know, rapidly rising debt for the rest of the world. And the consequences that come with that, and the question is how sustainable is that? Uh, so, you know, you talk about the 90s and the 2000s are, are two very interesting examples that are, of how you can have that go differently. So, in the 90s, what happened was this is really sort of before China in a lot of ways, but you had a massive corporate investment bubble. And uh, if you look at sort of the, you can break down the changes in the U.S. current account based on households, government, and businesses. Um, those data are published. Ideally, you want to go more granularly, like what kinds of houses, but that's much harder to find. But at that level, you can see very clearly that there was a massive uh, current account deficit in the United States that emerged in the second half of the 1990s, even during a period when the U.S. was practicing essentially fiscal restraint. So the budget balance at the federal level was basically zero by the time you get to the end of the 90s, if not a slight surplus. But that was more than offset by the fact that corporations went on a very large borrowing binge and investment binge. And the problem was, a lot of those investments turned out to be dug. And a lot of the companies that did them then went bankrupt and defaulted on their debts. And so you have this massive cutback in the investment afterwards. And so that suggests that, A, that wasn't a sustainable way of absorbing the foreign savings. And then you get to the 2000s, and what's the choice? Well, you know, again, you mentioned sort of the fiscal versus monetary, and you know, there was a bit of both in response to that downturn. So this massive class of business investment. But you know, monetary was an important thing. And, that, and, you know, it's hard to know exactly what people were thinking at the time. I think it's fair to say that some people at the Fed were thinking that part of what would have happened was you would have had a reversal of the dollar appreciation that had occurred after 1997. And that would have led to a sort of shift in the trade balance and that would have been helpful. But A, that didn't happen for a variety of reasons, including Chinese currency intervention, although not only that. But the other thing was that that did happen as a consequence is that uh, you had a very large increase in household investment and that American consumers borrowed tremendously in order to sustain consumption. And again, that wasn't sustainable either because you know borrowing to consume, or even for that matter, borrowing to buy housing is not something that you know it's not product, it's not going to increase your future income. And so sooner or later you're gonna problem on your debt service incapacity. And maybe you know you can refinance at lower and lower rates, but again, there's gonna be a floor there somewhere. So 
this is not a sort of sustainable long-term path towards uh, prosperity. And so then you end up essentially with, with 2008. So, you know, again, that, that, that's the trade-off. You, 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 there, there's no good way around this. So, Matt, let me think about the, this whole China development from a broader perspective. So, as you mentioned, past 30, 40 years that this phenomenon has been going on, we, we saw the maybe the most intense manifestation of it in the past decade. And and definitely the leaders in China made things worse through these, these policies you've mentioned. But shouldn't we have expected some kind of radical change given what has happened politically during this time? So, you know, the, the, the fall of the Soviet Union, you suddenly open up a whole big labor supply that didn't exist. China, massive surge in labor supply to the world. India opening up, using more closed economy. All of these things you think would have had some huge change and there would have been, it would have, had, no matter what had happened, you know, the perfect benevolent dictator in, in China, you know, dream team of leaders there, there still would have been some ramifications for the U.S. And, and I think of, for example, going back to, you know, turn of the century, you talk about this in your book, but, you know, there was a huge structural change in the U.S. The U.S. was growing from an agricultural-based economy to an industrial one. There were definitely transformational pains that, that occurred, no matter what policy you would have pursued. And I'm I'm wondering if there's some of that story in the background here too, that you know the US inevitably would have moved to more service driven sectors. I mean not, not just, you know, sorry jobs, but high end one, you know, all, all this literature about how how the creative class and big cities and you know I'm wondering if if the China shock and, and these policies in China maybe just hastened what was coming, maybe made it a little worse. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm inclined to say no. And the reason it sort of gets back to what, we said, what I was saying at the beginning, which is that global prosperity is not a scarce resource. So it's true. There was a massive increase in labor supply. And that was a good thing because you have all these people who are right. essentially behind the or whatever who were unable to participate in the global economy, and now they are. And that's, that's good for them. You also should have had a commensurate increase in demand. In fact, the increase in demand should have actually been higher, right? Because if you have all these countries and societies that had been artificially repressed and, and living essentially below their means because of communism and things like that, and then they become not that way, then that should actually mean that you have, in addition to people being able to consume more because of this big global economy, that means that returns on investment should be high and they should be getting a lot of influx of, of finance that way. So you should have had a really large increase in global demand, but that's not what happened. And the problem is, and, and by the way, if that had happened, then you might have seen some change in the composition of, so for example, in U.S. manufacturing or something. I'm not saying that it would have been static, but you would have had a situation where maybe, uh, you know, sectors that competed with imports would have shrunk, but sectors that exported would have grown. And so, commit, you know, that would have balanced out, for example. But the key thing here is that, you know, if you have higher labor supply, people who are paid less, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to lose all your jobs to that society. The only reason that happens is if they're paid less than the value of what they produce. That's sort of the key distinction, right? Like wages in the world are not, the lowest wages in the world are in Sub-Saharan Africa. You know, like Burkina Faso or Madagascar. That's where you're going to find the lowest wages in the world, by far. It's not China. It would never was China. I mean, China wages have gone up a lot, but and, and they, they were relatively low in the 90s, but they were never the lowest wages in the world. What matters is the difference between wages and uh, productivity. And, you know, this is also why, for example, you look at Northern European countries that have in large manufacturing sectors. Again, wages there are quite high. Wages in, in Japan and the US are high, we still have plenty of manufacturing. What matters is, is sort of that, that balance. And the thing that was really destructive about China's policies, in particular, although not only China's policies, was that workers were paid so much less relative to the value of what they produced. And that meant that if you were uh, an American or European company or Japanese company, or whatever, that moving production or outsourcing production to China would automatically boost your profitability, which is what they did. And so that was essentially the problem. Now, moving production to China isn't inherently bad, but the problem is you're moving it to a place where you're increasing your profitability and not really the domestic consumption of the people there. Right? If people in China had gotten paid commensurate with their worth and then spent more money, you wouldn't have had any trade imbalances. Now, you might have had less foreign investment there in the first place, so, uh, but, you know, it wouldn't have been, but even if there had been the equivalent amount of foreign investment, it wouldn't have been bad for the U.S. And you know, going back to the 90s again, you know, during the 1990s, you know, before the Asian financial crisis, crucially, so like, you know, pre-1998, 
the U.S. manufacturing sector was doing fine. You had all the globalization forces you were talking about that really began in 1989, but the U.S. manufacturing sector was fine. I mean, output was rising rapidly, employment was basically flat. So there was, I mean, there, but there were productivity increases going on, so that's not a problem. Yep. No one was complaining about any of that. It was only after you have this massive collapse in demand as a consequence of the Asian financial crisis and then people's responses to it in the rest of the world that then you have the problem of, of the collapse of U.S. manufacturing. And I think that's really an important context to have here, that it's not, you know, there is no reason why the industrialization of China or Canada or India or anywhere else should have to come to the extent of America. We can all do better and all prosper. So in this counterfactual world that you've just described, I suspect you think that there would have been less populism over the past few years had we had that outcome. I mean, did those things tie together? I would think so. I mean, you know, Michael and I are not political scientists, so this is just sort of yeah. a touristy observation here, but I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, people who have looked at this stuff, and we mentioned it at various points of book and occasion, like David Altshuler at, at MIT and his colleagues have looked at these things and trying to correlate, you know, manufacturing job losses to changes in voting behavior and stuff. And, and yeah, you can see that there's a clear relationship there. So you can imagine that if there hadn't been those kinds of manufacturing losses and the associated social devastation when all those good paying jobs disappear, that that yet populism in the U.S. would have been less of a thing, and probably in other societies as well, for that matter. Yeah, well, let's move to the policy prescriptions. We're running out of time, so I don't have time to talk about Germany. I encourage the listeners to go check out the very fascinating chapter on Germany. I want to move to the policy prescriptions because it ties into some of the events we're seeing right now. In fact, you've written a piece about this, about how to pay for the virus issuing debt, and you've already touched on this earlier, but I want to... Spell this out for our listeners a little bit more. I um, mean, you you touched on how the U.S. is the banker to the world. They provide the safe assets that everybody wants, and it's just almost insatiable demand for what we provide. And many times, you know, Americans look at the amount of the, the debt. You know, in fact, this year it's been forecasted. I think the CBO has it forecasted to reach about 100 percent of GDP when this year's over. May have been may have changed since I last I looked at it, but but it's going to go really up this year. And it, it alarms a lot of people. And yet, Matt, we see historically low interest rates, right? So, so the world is not viewing us as a credit risk despite the run-up in this. So what does this all mean for policy prescriptions? And, and how should we think about the U.S. debt if it is a part of the solution? So I think in general, it's absolutely right to highlight that interest rates are extraordinarily low, both in nominal terms and in real terms. And that is a clear market signal that there isn't enough debt being issued. Now, whether that's government debt specifically or other kinds of debt, you know, I don't think interest rates, you know, the people who trade interest rates care about that. But the fact of the matter is, for a variety of reasons, private debt is not rising. And so, therefore, you have, government debt should be the thing to, to rise efficiently. Uh, you know, it, unless, of course, you're just satisfied with a world in which real interest rates are negative 30 years out, which is indicative of extremely poor growth expectations. And I think that that seems like a world we shouldn't want. And I can tell you as a, that Barron's readers don't like that either, even if they, you know, stepping through all the consequences it takes a little bit of effort. And that's what I try to do in my, in my day job. But I mean, you know, I think in some ways the, the focus on government debt is really the problem here. And, and people think about that because, well, you know, you know, you're a voter or a taxpayer and like that's the thing you can sort of try to control or something you're most exposed to. But like what matters to the economy is really total debt. And total debt is rising now because the economy, essentially we're having a sort of this freak economic event that means a lot of people can't do things and, and that makes everybody poor. And so there's going to be a financial loss somewhere. Now you could have that financial loss more entirely by the private sector and that would show up in the form of basically everyone defaulting on their mortgage and, you know, not paying rent and so the landlords default on their mortgages and people go run down all their assets to try to sustain their consumption and they go bankrupt and businesses shut down. I mean, that's, that's one way to do it. Or, the change in net worth shows up on the public sector's balance sheet, and essentially, you know, houses and businesses don't have to do that, but the public sector becomes a lot more indebted, and that means issuing a lot more treasury debt. And I think if those are your choices, then you know, issuing government debt is quite attractive for a variety of reasons. And, you know, I mean, to the extent that, I mean, I think that's just the way to think about it. Everything has to add up. And, you know, if, if, if someone isn't going to be borrowing the way they were, and someone else has to borrow more to keep sort of, you know, satisfies, you know, demand for fixed income and things like that. And so, you know, if, if the people who were borrowing are people getting, you know, second mortgages and HELOCs in the 2000s, for example, then that wasn't 
really good for anybody long term. So having the government borrow in the way that I mean, there's, they don't really have default risk, they don't have rollover risk in the same way that households do. So it seems like a clearly superior trade, and, and that is really how I think about these questions. Yeah, I mean, if you think about how low interest rates are now, imagine where they would be if Trump, President Trump had not run the large budget deficits over the past few years, right? Um, and so I suspect many of the same people who worry about the size of the debt also worry about artificially low interest rates, right? And I just imagine now the perfect storm would be is we'd have negative interest rates or close to them in this crisis if we hadn't run up that deficit. So, I mean, one of the ironies of all this is that President Trump's you know fiscal policies – um, his tax cuts may actually be, you know, ameliorating some of the potential stress you see right now, because there are real costs and negative rates for for financial firms, for some entities. Um, so it's 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 kind of a bizarre world. When you, but you have to think through this carefully, otherwise you can lead to the improper policy conclusions. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just clarify briefly that I think the tax policy part of the reason why the impact on rates was lower than some people had anticipated was because a lot of the beneficiaries of those tax cuts then turned around and essentially saved the, the windfall. And so in other words, it was sort of a direct reinvestment of, you know, the deficit uh, was bigger than essentially went. So I do think it's fair to say that there were other fiscal policy changes that were definitely helpful. So for example, there had been a long period of um, essentially austerity on the military spending side and whether or not you think the US military should be spending more or less on equipment. The fact of the matter is, at least in the short term, that it definitely has an impact on GDP and, and manufacturing output. And you can see very clearly that starting at the end of 2016 until, you know, basically last year, there was this massive increase in, in uh, military spending in the, the, the monthly durable goods stuff. You look at shipments of military, uh, defense capital yeah. goods tremendously. And that was also helpful as well. So there was a whole bunch of things that were going on um, in terms of fiscal policy change. I think a lot of people overstated what the impact would have been, but except there wasn't impact that was basically beneficial. But your point is financing costs are really, really low and historically low. And we could use this to invest in fighting the virus. We could also use it to invest in infrastructure. Our country would benefit long run, make us more productive. And the world is effectively begging us for more debt. It's it's not like, you know, we are going on a spending spree and enforcing this on the world, the world's coming to us and, hey, please give us more debt. And we, we should look around. And, of course, the, the key is use it wisely. Don't just, you know, willy-nilly spend here and there. Um, use it wisely. I think that, that's a fair observation. Yeah, we're leaving a lot of money on the table, I think, is the way of looking at it. That even before the virus, interest rates were very low relative to expected growth rates. So and I think, I believe the real, the real interest rate on 30-year uh, inflation-protected securities peaked at like what one percent or something i think before they yep. just, uh, if if you think of a long-term growth trajectory you know real gdp of the u.s economy is one percent that's that's quite that's basically worse than anybody's consensus forecast even pretty pessimistic people so right. they're basically leaving money on the table right there and so yes if you can do and especially if it turns out that you could borrow money to make investments that will actually increase your kind of growth rate then you're really leaving money on the table and so we're all just making ourselves unnecessarily poor because uh, you know I guess not fully like thinking through what all the, the signals mean and what the, what these what these numbers are, are telling us, but that's absolutely right. I mean, there's a clear, I think, even independent of foreign demand for U.S. Treasury debt. That I think that although that's certainly there as well, but just the domestic need of the U.S. economy, I think, makes it quite clear that we've been leaving money on the table and, and we still are. Well, on that note, our time is out. Our guest today has been Matthew Klein. Matt, thanks so much for coming back on the show and discussing your book. Thanks very much for having me. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.